Welcome back to Mr. Hassan's Mass Channel. I'm now going to be answering question number two from the January 2023 International A Level NXL Pure Mathematics P3 exam. Um, this question here is about trig identities, and in particular, this is about um, where we have to rewrite this separate, um, you know, these separate trig functions into one trig function, one term, right? Two, two separate terms, make them into one term in terms of one trig ratio. And this is where we're going to be using what are called the addition formulae. Okay, we're going to use the addition formula to do this. So we have to express f of x in the form r cosine x minus alpha, where r and alpha are constants, where r is greater than zero and alpha is between zero and pi over two. So r must be positive and alpha must be an acute angle. So we got to give the exact value of r and give the value of alpha in radians to three decimal places. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that my calculator is in radian mode and it's not. So I'm going to change it into radian mode. Okay, now it's in radian mode, just in case. So straight away, I'm going to do that to make sure I don't make a silly mistake. Okay, like preempting any mistakes. And it says to three decimal places. Okay, normally we write things to three SF if they are in, in, in not in if the angles in, in radians, unless otherwise stated. Here, otherwise stated. So we're going to keep that in my mind also right from the beginning, because sometimes you get so caught up in the question by the end, you forget to look back at the instructions. So. You make a note of those things right at the beginning of the question in case you mess up there. Okay, now, um, how do we deal with this? Well, we'll start off by writing cosine x plus 2 sine x. We want to write it in the form r times cosine of x minus alpha. Now, we have from our formula sheet, which you can see, cosine A, and it says plus or minus B, is equal to cosine A times cosine B, minus plus sine A times sine B. You'll find that in the formula sheet. Okay? So, I want to expand this cosine X minus alpha. What I can't do is I can't say this is the same as cosine X minus cosine alpha. That's completely wrong. I can't just think of this as like, you know, cosine by itself means something. It doesn't mean anything. It has to have an angle. This whole angle is associated with the cosine. It doesn't mean cosine times x minus alpha. That doesn't make any sense. This is the cosine of this whole angle. So this doesn't work. You don't expand like this. You have to use the addition formulae, which you find in your formula book, the proof for which we can go through, but it's not the time for it. All right? So now, if you look at the way this is set up, you have cosine A minus B is cosine A cosine B plus sine A sine B. So here our A is the X and our B is the alpha. So if I rewrite this, the R will multiply both of these. If there's an R in front of this, it will multiply both of these. Don't forget that. So you have R, you have cosine X times cosine alpha plus, and then you have R times sine x times sine alpha. That's how that works. So now what I can do is I can take what I've got here and I can compare these two sides. They are, have to be the same. They are identical. It's an identity. So I can use the fact that these are identical. Whoops. One second. My x looks like an alpha there. x and alpha. x and alpha. Be careful with that. Okay, good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the coefficients on each side of this identity. So I'm going to first compare the coefficients of cosine x. If I compare cosine x coefficients on this side, okay, I'll just um, highlight the cosine x on this side and the cosine x on that side. On this side, the coefficient of cosine x is just 1. It's 1 cosine x. On this side, it's r times cosine alpha. And on this side, um, the coefficient of sine x. So now I'm going to compare the, um, the sine x's. On this side, the coefficient of sine x is 2. On this side, the coefficient of sine x is r sine alpha. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to compare also the sine x's. And I have 
In this case, on this side I have two, on this side I have r times sine of alpha. So from this I can say that the cosine of alpha is equal to one over r, and from this I can say the sine of alpha is equal to two over r, and from this I can work out what my r and my alpha is. Now many people just memorize um, you know, some sort of formula how to do this, and that's fine once you understand, okay? But I'm showing you how to understand this right from the start in case you didn't know. Okay, so I prefer to, to do things like, you know, rather than just memorize like a parrot, to, I prefer that my students understand what's going on. Okay, so um, let's try and make it a bit more realistic. Okay. Also, don't have to do this. You can draw any random right angle triangle. So, if I have a right angle triangle and I call this angle alpha, okay, um, the cosine of alpha is adjacent over hypotenuse. So, this would be one and this would be r. And the sine of alpha would be opposite over hypotenuse, which would be, that would be two over r. All right. So, if I work out what r is, I can use Pythagoras' theorem from this. So, r is equal to the square root of 2 squared plus 1 squared, which is the square root of 5. So r is equal to the square root of 5, it's exact value, exact value of r, root 5. And if I want to find what alpha is, I can just simply use tan. I can say the tangent of alpha is opposite over adjacent, 2 over 1, so therefore alpha is inverse tan of 2 in radians. Okay, so inverse tan of 2, we already changed it to radians, so that's fine. That gives us one point. 10714 1.10714 goes on now we want to write it to three decimal places okay so our alpha therefore will be 1.107 that's our alpha so therefore what we can say we can say that the cosine of x plus 2 sine x is equal to root 5 times the cosine of x minus 1.107. So there is what we were asked to write down in this form. And that's the answer to part A of this question. Okay, so we've expressed this in the form cosine x minus alpha, where alpha is in radians to three decimal places and r is written exact form. Okay. So that's the answer to part A. So that's a very typical way of answering this question. There are other ways that you could go on from here. For example, some people, they would square this line and square that line, and then they would, um, uh, you know, subtract these two or add these two equations, in which case you'll have R squared times cosine squared alpha plus R squared times sine squared alpha equals one squared plus two squared. And the cosine squared alpha and the sine squared alpha add together to give you one. So you're left with R squared equals five. So R equals root five. And then if you divide these two lines, if I divide this way, I'll have R sine alpha divided by R cosine alpha gives you tan alpha equals two. And then you find what alpha is. Both of those ways are perfectly fine. Okay, both of those are perfectly fine for you to answer this question. I personally like to just draw this triangle, but whichever way you prefer, it's fine. Even if you memorize, some people memorize what R is going to be and what alpha is going to be, okay, um, that's also fine as long as you don't mess up with your memory. All right, if you understand what's behind it, it's far better, of course. All right, now for part B, it says using the answer to part A. So we're using this answer, which is, Cosine x plus 2 sine x equals root 5 times the cosine of x minus 1.107. x minus 1.107. Okay, we have to use this answer to write down the exact maximum value of gx. All right, so gx is not the same as f of x. G of X is 3 minus 7 times F of 2X. Okay, so we want to find the exact ma maximum value of G of X. So before we can do that, we need to find the exact maximum value of F of X. Okay, or in fact, we want to find the exact 
minimum value of g of x. Why? Because what's happened in this transformation? Okay, if you look at this transformation, this is a combination of things that's happened. Now, when we're talk, talking about combinations of transformations, the first thing what's happened is we deal with what's inside the function first, right? So the first thing what's happened is the it's a horizontal stretch of factor of a half. So you can say the x values have been halved. The x values have been multiplied by a half. That's the first thing that's happened. Then we, we're dealing with stuff that's happening outside of the function. Seven is it's been multiplied by minus seven and three is added to it. So when it's outside the function, we deal with the opposite of bid mass. Okay, so we deal with bid mass. Was in inside the function, we deal with the opposite of bid mass. Outside the function, we deal with bid mass. So we're dealing with the multiplied by minus seven. So let's let's talk about multiplied by um, minus one first. Okay, so that's a reflection. So the minus one part, it's a reflection in the x-axis. So it's been reflected in the x-axis. Okay, that's that's the next thing that's happened. And the third thing that's happened, it's a stretch by factor seven. It's stretch by factor seven, vertical stretch. So the y coordinates, the y coordinates have been multiplied by. 7. So these two together means that the y coordinates are multiplied by minus 7. Together that means these y coordinates are multiplied by minus 7. That causes reflection in the x axis and a vertical stretch of factor 7. All of that together in one go can be done by multiplying the y coordinates by negative 7. And then finally, what's happened is it's been um, a vertical translation, it's been translated vertically. Okay, so basically the, 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 the vector is 0, 3. So basically we're going to add 3 to the y coordinates. Okay, so if we can determine that we want to find the maximum value of g of x. Now, because it's been reflected in the x-axis, like for example, if you have a maximum, it looks like this. If you reflect this in the x-axis, it's going to look, it's going to become minimum. It's going to become a minimum. So if you have something that's a minimum and it's reflected in the x-axis, it's going to become a maximum. Okay, it's going to become a maximum. All right. So what we need to do is we need to first work out what the minimum of gx is going to be because then that will be a maximum in, sorry, the minimum of f of x is going to be because that, that, that minimum of f of x will become a maximum in g of x because it's reflecting in the x-axis. So the first thing is we've got to find the minimum of f of x, the minimum value of f of x. Now, if we look at f of x, as we have here, we can see that f of x is equal to root 5 times the cosine of x minus 1.107. So we can say that f of x minimum is going to be when this is equal to minus 1. And this is minus 1. So it's going to be minus root 5. Okay, so the minimum point or the minimum value of y for this function is minus root 5. So what do we have to do to it? Um, it's going to become a maximum. So what of us going to have to gx? So what we're going to do is for g of x, we're going to take this value here. This is the y value of um, f of x. Okay, for g of x, we can say the maximum is going to be for the y value. You're going to take the y value and you're going to, first of all, you don't have to worry about this 2x part for the y value because that's not affected by the 2x, the x coordinate is, but we don't have to worry about that first. We're going to do all that in part two. This is part one we're dealing with first. So what we're going to do now is we're going to, um, first of all, we're going to multiply by minus seven. So you have, you have three minus seven times minus root five. That's what we have to do. So this is going to be three plus 7 root 5. So write down the exact maximum value of g of x. That's the maximum value. Exact meaning without you know taking away the third, leave it in third form. Okay, so 3 plus 7 root 5. So the first thing we did was we multiplied it by minus 7 and then we added 3 to it. So there is the maximum value of g of x. And then it says, find the smallest positive value of x for which this maximum occurs giving your answer to two decimal places. So basically what we're going to do now is we'll take f of x and we'll find the smallest value for where 
the minimum of f of x occurs. Okay, so we're going to find when cosine of x minus 1.107 is equal to minus 1. That will give us the smallest value of x for when we have a minimum of f of x. Okay, and then what we have to do to that x value is we have to just basically divide it by 2 because the transformation in terms of x of this is only f to x where the x values have been a halved. Okay, so the x values have been a halved. So now to solve this, this equation here, we're going to take inverse cosine of both, of both sides. You have an x minus 1.107 equals inverse cosine of minus 1. Now the inverse cosine of minus 1 in terms of radians is going to be um, pi. Okay, so if we just look at that inverse cosine of minus 1, that gives us pi. So we have x minus 1.107 is equal to pi. So x is equal to pi plus 1.107. Okay, so we end up with plus 1.107. That gives you 4.24859. 4.24859. So therefore, the, x co the, the coordinates of the minimum point are... 4.24859 and the y coordinate as we found earlier was minus 5 okay minus 5 that is the minimum point minus root 5 sorry so now when we have f of 2x that's the only thing that affects the x we're going to take the x value which is 4.24859 and we're going to divide it by 2 that means the x values are halved okay so we take this value and that gives divided by two that gives us 2.124 that's 2.124 let's make sure 2.12429 okay so how do we have to write our answer to two decimal places so therefore you can say that the the um the maximum occurs First, when x equals 2.12. Okay, so there's the answer to that question. So you have to have a good understanding in this question of transformations of functions. Okay, how the transformations work, what gets affected by the transformations. So anything outside the function is affected. The y coordinates, anything inside the function affects just the x coordinates. All right. So when they're asking us to find the exact maximum value of GX, they're talking about in terms of its Y value. All right. You have to think about the fact that, first of all, the minimum of F of X becomes the maximum of G of X because you're multiplying the Y values by minus by a negative number. So it's the, the something that will that looks like um, this now will look like that when you reflect it in the x-axis so from a minimum it becomes a maximum and then you have to understand how you know these are affected by the different types of uh, transformations so what's a reflection what's a stretch what's a translation and so on so there's the answer to question number two i think that was all of two yeah so two a and b okay so you have to have a good understanding of transformations and the order of transformations as well as um you know your, what the graphs look like and so on. So there's your answer to question two. Other questions from this particular um, paper can be found in the playlist, the link for which will appear in this region here. Other questions from the topic of trig identities um, can be found in the playlist over here. That's in, I th the addition formula. I think that's a separate maybe um, playlist. You can also find uh, the playlist for transformations of functions, which will, I'll, I'll put in this area over here. And you can, you can uh, watch the video, which will help you to navigate through my channel more efficiently by clicking on the link up there. Thank you for watching and see you soon.